One, two, three. Hello, welcome to Rock the Cash Bar. I'm Ben Mowbray. And I'm Diane Gallagher. Every week we pick one song and do a deep dive into the lyrics and explain the different ways they've been interpreted. We will also discuss how the song connected to us on a personal level, focusing on all the embarrassing details. Glad to have you here. Enjoy the show. Bingin', bangin', boomin' new intro. What? How professional do we look? You're getting pretty good at this. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Thank you very much. That is Chuck Savage on the guitar and Eddie Hawkins on the piano. Man, we fooled you, didn't you? You think that we got like rights from The Clash, but we did not. (laughs) (laughs) That was fantastic. I'm glad we have that. So happy to finally have that. He really sent us this gorgeous surprise um, and we are so thankful for Chuck. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate that. How are you, Diane? I'm good. You're an attractive lady. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. You have bright blue eyes. Yes. A winning smile. Yes. Long flowing locks. Mid size. Okay. I have a story for you. Okay. Not so much a story, so much as just like an idea. Okay. An imaginarium, if you will. Okay. It's not out of the question that, say, you're driving home tonight and a group of men. Okay. A, your eye. Is caught by a group of men. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. They catch you too. Mm -hmm. They spy you. On the freeway? Mm hmm. Oh, okay. And they go, oh, (laughs) there's a goddess. Ooh. So they begin to chase you. Oh, they're chasing me. They're chasing you now, yeah. Okay. They're following you. They're honking their horns. Mm -hmm. These men are in like a victorious mood. They've just won a great victory over men from beyond the sea, or maybe they're. Ultimate Frisbee League Championship. Whatever it is, it's making me very nervous. Something like that, yeah. Yeah. They're chasing after you. Thankfully, you've got a car that is top-fueled. I used to. The engine is good to go. Okay. It's also a little magical. Ooh. Yes. What's happening in my car? So you outrun them. Yeah. For three days. Oh, shit. Yeah. Oh, shit. Three (laughs) days and nights, they're given chase. They're led by a man named, we'll just call him Kyle. Okay, Kyle. This seems like something Kyle would pull off. It's a fucking Kyle move. Kyle's lieutenants are chasing out after you. They can't catch you. Mm -hmm. You're magical. Kyle starts getting more and more upset. And he starts to take the lead. And Kyle just shouts, stop. And there's something about the timber of Kyle's voice that makes you stop. I stop the car. You stop the car. You pull over to the side of the road. You get out. And you meet Kyle. Am I scared? At first, but you more or less instantly fall in love with Kyle. Diane, that's such a Diane thing to do. Okay. He's real good at Ultimate Frisbee (laughs) and killing other dudes. He's real good at it. This is a bad boy. (laughs) Everything about his bearing and countenance is just like, this guy is confident. He's got everything. He's everything I need, right? Yeah. So you immediately fall in love with him. Uh Trouble is, you are already married. Yes, I am. Mm -hmm. So what are you going to do? God, what do I do? Is Do I just go off in this new crazy frisbee golf world with Kyle? Well, first you've got to use your husband's love and trust mm-hmm. against him. So you take Kyle back to your house and you trick your husband into jumping into Kyle's gym bag, which also happens to be magically bottomless. That's the thing that can happen. You mix too much Axe body spray and beard oil, <laughs> and you end up with a bottomless gym bag. It's happened so many times. If Corbin's drunk enough, he might. So your husband is now abandoned in the void of Kyle's bottomless gym bag, and you and Kyle are in love. Yes. You give Kyle a son. On the first night that your son is born, you entrust him to Kyle's six housemates. Kyle has six housemates. He's real good at ultimate frisbee and killing people. (laughs) Real good at it. So he's got six maids that are going to take care of your new son. Yes. While you're sleeping, your son disappears. These housemaids don't want to be blamed for it. Again, Kyle, real good at ultimate frisbee. Also, (laughs) highly trained at murder. They don't want to get caught for that. So they murder some dogs and rub some blood on you. Oh, God. And convince Kyle 
that you have murdered your own son. What's Kyle going to do? Believe his Frisbee golf friends. He'll probably believe his Frisbee golf friends. Actually, he uses his Frisbee golf friends to force you to sit outside your house, you and Kyle's house, and confess to anybody who goes by that you've murdered your own son. And I just go with this? You just go with it, yeah. Okay. Meanwhile, across town, uh, there's a guy who hears noises in the middle of the night, and he comes out and he finds that it's a tow truck driver who's about to tow his truck away, right? And he gets really angry, and he chases him away with a shotgun. And as the tow truck driver flees, he finds a baby. Your baby. My baby. He takes it in. He raises it as his own. As the years go by and Kyle's fame grows and grows and grows, Mm -hmm. he realizes that his son looks exactly like Kyle. He realizes that this baby must be Kyle's missing baby. So he takes the baby back to you and Kyle. How old is this boy? Seven or eight years old. Okay. And he says, this must be your son. And you couldn't be happier. Because it didn't kill him. You didn't kill him. You're released from your prison outside your own home. You hug him and you rename him Worry because of all the trouble that he caused. (laughs) And everybody lives happily ever after, more or less after that. You and Kyle are terrific. Worry grows up and uh, he owns a chain of Jersey Mike's subs uh, all across the the outer suburbs. Oh my gosh. Everything could be any more wonderful. That's Corbin's favorite sandwich. (laughs) (laughs) That's the story of Rhiannon. Holy shit! (laughs) More or less. I'm sure it's a little bit more beautiful, like, in the original Welsh. I wouldn't be surprised if the medieval bards put a little more effort into it than I did, but that's Rhiannon. Wow, well, I'm glad we're not covering Rhiannon today. (laughs) That was a long way to go. That was a long, long way to go. Well, um, now we don't have to cover Rhiannon, because it's obviously, (laughs) we've made it very clear to everybody exactly what that song is about. Welcome to Rock the Cash Bar. Today we're doing Fleetwood Mac. And when you're talking about Fleetwood Mac, you have to talk about the trickster coyote witch from (laughs) Arizona, Stevie Nicks. I love her. (laughs) And apparently, as we found out during one, that this is a guilty pleasure song for Ben. (laughs) It really is. We're doing Landslide. Uh Mm-hmm. This song makes me feel wistful. It fills me with a bit of longing. It sets the spirit free a little bit. Do you want to just jump into the lyrics? Um, Well, I'm going to ask you a question first. Uh Who did you hear sing this song first? I don't know. Because my friend Michelle did not know it wasn't a Smashing Pumpkin song for a very long time. I did know it wasn't a Smashing Pumpkin song. Yeah. Uh, but I think I heard the Fleetwood Mac version. You think you heard that first? I yeah. think I did too. Um, and I think I n- remember when the Dixie Chicks covered it, a lot of people thought it was theirs. They, I, I don't know if there's... I mean, I, it had to have been like young people at the time that just only grew up listening to country because I was like, how do you not know that this was Fleetwood Mac? But the Dixie Chicks just owned it so well, and they did such a great version with their cover that, you know, yeah. it was a big hit. It's, I mean, it's, just, it's such an amazing song that yeah, I don't think you can fail with it. It's almost right. like it's like uh, like Lou Reed's Pale Blue Eyes. Yeah. Know, it's just, you can't, like, you can pick up a guitar and you can do it. Here's the thing about mm. Landslide. This is why I've been wanting to do this song for so long. It's not even that it's one of my favorite songs. It's not even that I love it. I do like it a lot. The lyrics, for the longest time, I'm like, this makes no sense. I do not get this. It kind of reminds me, well, we'll get to this other song that we're going to cover one day, that Wider Shade of Pale. Mm -hmm. I love it because I don't know what the fuck he's talking about. But in this song, the lyrics have always confused me. And then I had this epiphany one day of me and Corbin were talking about this song, and we came up with our whole idea of what we think the song is about, which... Okay, Stevie's going to give a lot of different reasons of what she thinks, what she says this song is about when she wrote it. And we are still like, nah, girl, we know the truth. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, get into that. we'll get into that in a minute. But yeah, let's dive into the lyrics first. <laughs> Landslide by Fleetwood Mac. Lyrics by Stevie Nicks. I took my love. I took it down. I climbed a mountain and I turned around and I saw my reflection in the snow covered hills till the landslide brought me down. All right. Where are you with that? First time you hear the song, where, where, where are you visualing, visualizing with that? She's doing an incredible job of, of making the vision for me. Like I, I'm seeing the, the mountain. 
you know, I see my reflection on a snow covered hill. So yeah, I guess there's part of me that, I guess I see it two ways. Like in my mind's eye, I can see Stevie Nicks face kind of floating ethereally above a snow covered mountain. But then I also see my own, which kind of makes me giggle a bit. Okay. And what is this mountain a metaphor for you? Uh, it's, it's a snow covered mountain. So, so I, it's literal. Yeah. Okay. Like I think it's, it's a cold and frosty mountain. Like okay. If you see your reflection over a cold frosty mountain, then have you become a cold and frosty person? Okay. All right. I think the first time I heard this, I took my love, I took it down. I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> like, <laughs> do you love somebody and you stopped loving somebody? You're reflecting on your love and then you stopped uh, climbed a mountain and I turned around. Is that like um, getting to the top of her feelings and then turning around and looking back on her whole life? Felt like she was too young at this point to have a whole life to look back down on. Seeing her reflection in a snow-covered hill. I've looked at a hill covered in snow in Breckenridge and I can't really see myself in it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a lot of rich people there. I felt like I didn't belong there. Um, so the landslide brought me down. Um, I felt feel like um, something went wrong in her life. This is me trying to understand the poetry of the song. The song has always been like, I consider myself poetic and I can understand metaphors. And I've always been like, "Ah, what? (laughs) What's going on here? Um, I've often thought that the mountain could be her lover. That she, that she, she climbed his mountaintop like mm-hmm. he becomes the mountain and then she turns around looks around, sees everything that she could see on top of him, on top of that mountain. And then, the landslide, which comes from the mountain, wipes her right off of it. Okay. So it's like she made it to his peak, like as good as he could get. And then once she made it to that place in his psyche, the mountain pushed her off. Okay. Like you just went like, I can't handle this. I don't want to handle this. Right. I don't want you. You're just a person on the mountain. Off you go. Yeah. You got dumped. Yes. The landslide is a dump. Yeah. Here, a here comes your avalanche. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, mirror in the sky. What is love? Can the child within my heart rise above? Can I sail through the changing ocean tides? Can I handle the seasons of my life? So I could see that as as Stevie Nicks or the speaker, whoever, just like like looking back up after the landslide and just going, "What do I do now? What What do do I do? do? Like this is just another is another hurdle I got to get over, another beast I've got to slay." Yeah, and how many more times is this going to happen in my life? Can like this hurt me? Can I handle this happening, this ebb and flow of the ocean, the changing Mm -hmm. ocean tides? Like, is life going to ebb and flow like this my whole life? This hurts. Am I going to be able to handle this over and over and over? Is that what life is? Yeah. You know? Yeah, they're continually, the waves crashing. Ooh, that's very F. Scott Fitzgerald, too. Mm -hmm. I'll come straight back to the born against the tide. Yeah. uh Uh-huh. Well, I've been afraid of changing because I've built my life around you. But time makes you bolder. Even children get older. And I'm getting older, too. Was she like 27? <laughs> Come down, Nikki. Yeah. <laughs> Stevie. It'll it be Nikki? all right. There's a lot more life to live. A lot more things to feel. Yeah. Uh, when I built my life around you, here's the thing. It, like A lot of people have listened to the re-record. She did like a live recording of this song. And when she starts the song, she says, the song is for you, Daddy. And it changed everything. Because now when she says, I, uh, I built my life around you, I'm like, around your daddy? <laughs> because I was thinking of you and a lover with yep. this. So that's the way, like if I was just reading the lyrics to this song, I would think of it as a, as a breakup song as something yeah. that, that, that's gone, that, that two lovers talking to each other or Stevie Nicks talking to her lover. However, uh, this song was going to be the wedding dance song that, uh, when I was a young man, my then girlfriend was always planning on dancing with her dad at, at her wedding. Oh my God. Yeah. So I've never been able to think of this song as really anything other than that. A daddy daughter like, song. Yeah. When we first like sat down to kind of work on this, I had to like, I had to divorce myself from it. You yeah. Know? You can't think about that. Like just take the text for what it is. But every time I read it, all I can think about is this is the perfect daddy daughter wedding dance song. I think it's a bizarre one. I mean, this mm-hmm. lyric is okay with me as far as a daddy daughter song, mm-hmm. um, but the beginning part doesn't connect to me as a daddy daughter song, like the first line. But well, because the first line is "I took my love, I took it down." Right, and then you know, there's a landslide, and I'm like, "What happened with dad?" Well, I think "I took my love and I took it down" means that that what I first learned to be love, mm-hmm. the love that I had for my father, has now changed to the love that I have for my husband. Yeah, that makes sense. So I okay, took my I love, I took it down. I'm going to take a drink. Sorry about the ice. That's all right. Mm -hmm. The ice tinkling in glasses. Then it goes into the, uh, the, is it the third verse? Oh, take my love, take it down. 
will climb a mountain and turn around. And if you see my reflection in the snow covered hills, well, the landslide will bring it down. And if you see my reflection in the snow covered hills, well, the landslide will bring it down. So I think, in a, like the literal text translation is, is she's like, she's urging her former lover to go through the same pain that she's been through. Okay. But she went up to the top of that mountain and then his landslide brought her down. I think what she's now saying is like, okay, well now you have to climb my mountain. You got to climb the mountain that is me. Uh huh. I'm going to push you off and we're going to be done with this. Okay. Like I... I can understand that. If I was just looking at it literally, that's how I would take it. I can see it. Yeah. I think I would get there too. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I just feel like there's two... There could be so many different things happening in this song. So many different people she's talking to. So here's what me and Corbin <laughs> came to. <laughs> it's... Uh, kind of well known that Fleetwood Mac, Stevie, and the gang like to do the cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> Did they ever? They like to do the drugs uh, and the drugs like them. So, and this is not a high thought. Corbin and I don't get high. This mm-hmm. is two parents drinking water thinking, wait a minute. She's saying, you know, oh mirror in the sky, what is love? But she said, I saw my reflection in the snow covered hill. I'm like, you poured Coke on a mirror back then. You had chopped it up with the razor. And then you look down to snort it and you see your face. You in the see mirror. your reflection in the snow covered hill. Oh. Everybody calls cocaine snow. Yeah. And until the landslide brought it down. Cocaine fucks up your life. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and then it makes it even weirder when she's like, this song's for you, Daddy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But I'm like, don't tell your dad about that. No, that, that's just her rebellious young lady's spirit in her. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've been afraid of changing because I've built my life around you. That could just, you know, then we were like, ah, I don't know. You know, she's partying and she's afraid of like growing up and children get older. I'm getting older too. I got to quit this shit. Um, yeah. Well, what if that's what she's saying? When like, I've been afraid of change. I've built my life around drugs. Yeah. Like accidentally. I didn't yeah. mean to, but yeah, obviously it's the only thing that's important to me. So she goes through, I went through all this research of like, the band said it's about this. And then later on, the band said it's about this. And later on, I was like, okay, you keep changing your story. (laughs) Like about what it is, what it's about. And I think it's one of those songs where it even changed, the lyrics changed meaning for them personally as the years went by. And Corbin and I are still like, yeah, but it was always about that. But you just didn't want your parents to know you're singing about drugs. (laughs) Yeah, I could definitely see that. I totally subscribe to the cocaine theory of landslide. I just think it's a beautiful way to talk about doing blow and being a little regretful about where it's taking your life. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. I yeah, like then, it. Yeah, but then, like, in, in, the, in that third verse, she's, is she, like, telling her lovers, like, okay, you need to get as fucked up on cocaine as I got. <laughs> like, don't come out of that until you got a hole in your nose to match mine. <laughs> I don't know. Let's have one last big blowout. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see where it takes us. <laughs> if you don't spend at least a month in rehab twice, and you haven't felt the pain that I have felt, lover. So I'm only half serious about thinking the song is about her doing blow. But now that I've put that bug in your ear, you're going to think about it too every time she talks about seeing her reflection in the snow-covered <laughs> hill. Okay? <laughs> I have never done cocaine off of a mirror. Like, I have no idea what it's like to look at my reflection and sit there. Yeah, I've done it off a Cheaper by the Dozen 2 DVD cover. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it matters. <laughs> I've never done a line. I've never done, like, a full honest line. I've only ever done, like, like a the key... The little key bump. A little key bump, yeah. Fingernails. I've, I've never... Because like, I've never bought it. I've never had any for my own. It's Same thing. Like... I never liked it. Um, I, the only... The first time I ever did it was because I was way too drunk, and I was meeting up with a boy, mm-hmm. <laughs> and he took too long to get to the party. And I was like, oh, my God, to my friend, I was like, I'm slurring. I'm drunk, and I'm going to be so embarrassed. I haven't seen this guy. He was an old friend. I hadn't seen him in years. And um, she was like... I hate to be, sorry, there's a big truck. I hate to be the person that introduces this into your life, but if you take the smallest amount, it will just click you back into (laughs) reality. You'll stop slurring. You'll feel completely sober. And um, I was so drunk. I mean, I don't think you could ever talk me into doing it sober, Mm -hmm. Um, but I was so drunk and I did. And she was right. And I was like, all right, I can talk now. And like, (laughs) I didn't even do enough to feel what other people feel. And I think that's why I never got into it. I was too scared to ever like fully do it because um, I see how it wrecks people's lives. Yeah. And so what I would do with it, um, 
is like, you know, Corbin and I would have these big parties, but I was getting a little too old for these parties that were lasting till 5 a.m. So, but I didn't want to just fall asleep in my house while sometimes strangers were in my house. So every now and then I would do a little bit of it late at night just and just start cleaning mm-hmm. like just cleaning the house and then people would start, kind of start getting the idea like should we go diane's cleaning she's taking the garbage <laughs> out and i'm like yeah maybe maybe you need to go but That's also sudden- i don't want to wake up hung over to a mess you know <sighs> And she's suddenly hyper focused. Yeah. <laughs> and she's telling me this really long story while she's doing yeah. it. <laughs> but yeah, it was never just a drug that I liked. And it was mm. only a handful of times that I have ever done it. And it was one of those that I was like, I'll never get addicted to this. I just don't enjoy it enough. That's how drugs find you. Like, it's never a stranger in a dark alley. It's always a friend who's trying to help. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't make you feel better. You know what you need. <laughs> I'm just so fortunate that I don't have an addictive personality and I I feel bad for people who maybe their first time with it was something that similar and then they just went off the rails, you know. I think that's part of the reason why I stay away from it is because I do have a very addictive personality. Mm -hmm. Like, I've never gone casino gambling because I'm like, I have every other thing. (laughs) There's no need to find out if that's another hole in my boat. (laughs) Let's not pile this on, yeah, Yeah. for sure. (laughs) This song was written... It was Lindsey Buckingham and and Stevie Nicks who wrote this song before they were in Fleetwood Mac. Yes. They went on a, I think it was on a vacation to Denver, Colorado. And so she's apparently just like just on their balcony or wherever they were looking up at the snow-capped peaks. Right. And these were the the paragraphs that she started to write about. Right. Because she insists that she writes every day. That she's just that kind of artist. Just like, I have to have my piano. I have to have my notebooks. I need to produce every day in order to be happy. Okay. And I believe that. We're comics, and we know comics that do that, too. They don't go anywhere without their moleskin notebook, and they're constantly writing. I'm horrible with that. Yeah. I put notes in my phone. Yeah. And my, yeah, that's what I'd use now. I think it's just, it's magical to, like, when I read that first paragraph, I took my love, I took it down, climbed a mountain, turned around. To think that you could have that moment where you're, where you're 23 or 24 you're seeing the world for the first time. You're probably, she may have been in the mountains for the first time. She's with her exciting guitar player boyfriend. Yeah. And doesn't know, you know, like, like her whole life is, is spread out in front of her and she writes these lyrics and then they work their way into every skull on the face of the planet. Yeah. Like it's incredible to me to think of. It's got to be a hell of a feeling to sing this song night after night the way that she does. Yeah. So I see all these like differing things. I mean, this is a minor detail. It doesn't matter. I have... This song is about a father-daughter relationship. Stevie Stevie wrote it on the guitar in about five minutes in Aspen, Colorado. Who cares? It's Colorado. Mm. She was surrounded by mountains thinking, wow, all this snow could just come tumbling down around me and there's nothing I could do about it. When she feels like this, she just goes into a room and writes her thoughts down so she can read it and ponder what she has written. Um, And then later on, she says, my dad did have something to do with it, but he absolutely thinks that this... Uh, was the whole complete reason that it was written but um, she says it's not and then it says later on that um, she wrote this the night before her dad who was the president of Greyhound Bus Lines was operated on at the Mayo Clinic I'm like okay there's just a lot of oh really? yeah that's an interesting line I had no other there was just one line of this in my research and I was like can we expand on this a little bit like why was he having an operation was he dying Uh What, what was going on here I don't know. I think I buy the father-daughter thing a hell of a lot more now. Do you? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just like, it, it's all, that's just the way it's always sat in my head. Yeah. Like, cause I've heard this song, you know, years before when I was a kid. I think my parents had Fleetwood Mac albums that it mm-hmm. was just, it was one of those like background songs. Right. But it wasn't until, you know, my girlfriend started saying like, this is the song that I want to dance with my dad with that I, yeah. that, that I started like really looking at it and thinking about it. Like I could never, just those two lines. Well, I've been afraid of changing because I've built my life around you. Yeah. That was... It just seems so perfect to be a father-daughter thing. Yeah. Like it, I think it's it also a weird aging thing. In 2014, Nix told the New York Times, I wrote Landslide in 1973 when I was 27, and I did already feel old in a lot of ways. I've been working, I had been working as a waitress and cleaning, a cleaning lady for years, and I was tired. Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah, and there was a part of it, like, um, right before this, like, she made it big and joined Fleetwood Mac, her dad was saying, uh, you've put a lot of time into this. Maybe you should give this six more months. And if you want to go back to school, we'll pay for it. So basic, basically, she had six more months yeah. to make that decision. And then 
everything blew up. But that's the time, like when you're 27, that's the time that your mind starts kind of playing tricks on you. I think mm-hmm. that's why, it's just morbid, but I think that's why you have the 27 club. Because yeah, Because you get I know. to that age where you think like, oh, fuck, this is me now. Yeah, it's you know? a pivotal year for some reason. Yeah. What have I done? What have I accomplished? My early 20s are over. This is clearly the adult that I am. I'm not proud of it. Mm-hmm. So I think you, you you get sucked into whatever spiral you're onto. I started stand-up comedy at 27. Did you really? I started it. I was, I was late. I was late, late. I was late on everything. It took me mm-hmm. eight years to get a four-year degree. Um, I couldn't figure out what I wanted to do with school. I was paying for a lot of it myself and taking out loans. I would have to drop a semester every now and then. So it's not that I was dumb. It's just that it was a little harder. I didn't have like the, here, go off to university and we will pay for it. And you knock it out in four years. That wasn't my life. And it was my final semester of my senior year of college when uh, I accidentally fell into (laughs) stand-up. Don't feel bad. I'm on year 23 of my four-year degree. Yeah. All right. Good. (laughs) Okay, so you don't have to go deep into it, but give me the Cliff's Notes, Bert, Cliff's Notes version of she started off dating Lindsay Buckingham, and then when they got into Fleetwood Mac, she started dating Mick. The right? Cliff Notes version of all of the inner workings of the Fleetwood Mac affairs mm-hmm. would take seven hours. Oh, jeez. <laughs> It's like big, this, yeah, deep this, breath. It's like Genesis. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably better if you're just like, okay, everybody was fucking everybody. Yeah. All right. Like it's, and then uh, everybody stopped. So they say. Like okay. it's, it's. I think that's why the story is so fascinating because like, like when does a love affair end? Yeah. Like, like okay, we physically haven't slept with each other in years. But, but they all play together. They all play together. They all still are still carrying on a relationship together. Like right. There's no. It's. It would be a. Re, it's. That's why Fleetwood Mac is so fascinating because this would be endlessly difficult. Like anybody who didn't have... In a regular have, group of friends. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you didn't have hundreds of millions of dollars and your artistic legacy riding on it, there's absolutely no way you'd continue working with somebody who was sleeping with your wife. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> you wouldn't continue working with a woman who was no. sleeping with your ex-husband. No, they're very but, forgiving and forward thinking. <laughs> is it forward thinking? Like, I think I this is... Like, it's hard for me to... Because obviously there's, there's part of me as like a, a very young Gen Xer to be looking at like Fleetwood Mac as like, it's almost like the like the hippies consoling each other. Yeah, right. You know, like, because here's Fleetwood Mac starts in like the, the kind of mid to late 60s, right? Mm-hmm. And it's all dudes to start off with, right? It's it's Mick Fleetwood and John McVie are the are Mick Fleetwood plays drums, John McVie plays the bass, and then they have assorted other men who are around there. And they have all of the hippie problems that you could possibly imagine. Their lead singer was a guy named Peter Green. And Peter Green played in a band called John Mayall's Blues Breakers. All right. Which is kind of a musician's breeding ground. Eric Clapton was in the Blues Breakers. So they had this like legendary, you know, they're they're great musicians. John Mayall, for Peter Green's birthday, gives Peter Green a couple of hours of studio time. Just like, okay, here, go record your own thing. So he takes Mick Fleetwood and John McVie and takes them into the studio and they record uh, some instrumental pieces, right? Mm-hmm. That they just they call Fleetwood Mac. Okay. He just calls it that because it's like, I'm playing with Mick Fleetwood and playing with John McVie, right? From that, Fleetwood Mac kind of arises. Then they go into the hippie bullshit problems. Peter Green is taking LSD like you wouldn't believe. He chars Fries his, brain his brain just to cinders, just absolutely burns himself oh, to the terrifying. ground. And if you go back, and I did this to myself last night, if you go back and you listen to the Blues Breakers, you have to be high. Like, <laughs> there's just no way to enjoy it. It's this really like it's they're, like they're English dudes who fell in love with blues music, right? Mm-hmm. Like we you there's a lot of bands over that do and that, over yeah. and over again. <laughs> But man, they slow it down. Like they're obviously like clearly high. And in all the videos that you see of them, they're just they're just lost in it the way hippies get lost <laughs> in it, man. Like we're just jamming. Like you know there must be like twenty eight minute solos. And like, <laughs> they don't even know stuff. where they went. Yeah. And uh, close your eyes and, and picture a, a hippie who's just loving playing his music, but is unbelievably high on LSD. Yep. That's Peter Green. Don't describe it. That's what he looks like. Like he's just he's just absolutely that archetype. Right. That's where they're coming from. So Peter Green leaves, like one guy leaves, Peter Green leaves for LSD, another guy leaves for alcoholism, another guy leaves to go join the Children of God religious cult. Oh, Jesus. Like, it's everything hippiedom, oh, right? Oh, God. And so then Fleetwood Mac 
forms, because, like the, the remaining members of Fleetwood Mac, which is basically just just uh, Mick Fleetwood, John McVie, and John's wife, Christine McVie, Christine. who has since joined the band. Like after Peter Green left, they needed a singer, so they brought in Christine McVie, whose name used to be Christine Perfect, and she had you know kind of a, a solo career and a, and a career with a band called Chicken Shack that she had some success with. They joined the band, and that becomes Fleetwood Mac, right? They moved to Los Angeles because England is dead to them. Okay. Like they're they're not making a dent in London anymore. Partly because they see they're like they're like the cast offs of, of John Mayall's Blues Breakers, but also because all of their band members have spiraled down into god awful tragedy. Right. So they kind of like seek comfort in Los Angeles. While they're there, they hear a tape that Lindsey Buckingham has made. And they ask him, like, do you want to be our, our new guitarist? Lindsey Buckingham meets with them and says, all right, I'll, I'll be in your band, but I'm only going to be in it if you bring Stevie Nicks yeah, as well. Yeah, they're a package deal. They were a package deal, right? He didn't tell Mick Fleetwood, John McVie, and Christine McVie that they were dating. Oh. They just thought it was common knowledge. So it wasn't until... It, and not only were they dating, but as they joined Fleetwood Mac, their relationship was already deteriorating. Oh. So they're trying to keep it hidden. Like, not only are they trying to keep their relationship hidden, but they're trying to keep the fact that their relationship is also deteriorating hidden. So can you imagine, like, meeting new people and just being like, okay, this is uh, <coughs> this mm-hmm. is just a guy I know who really likes the... But your marriage is breaking up? Yeah. Like, it's, it's a layered secret that they're trying to keep. Wow. Uh, also around that time, uh, John McVie and Christine McVie are starting to break up. Like, their marriage is on the rocks. Right. Mick Fleetwood is married to a woman who, thank God, is not at Fleetwood Mac, but they're getting divorced too. So all of this is going on all at once as they go in to record uh, Rumors, which is their, that's not the album that, that Landslide is on, but obviously it's their, it's their big, right, the know, big huge one. selling thing. So yeah, Fleetwood Mac is a great big key party. It's obviously the hippies trying to care. Like, how do you, like, it, oh, it's, it's love everybody, free love. Okay, mm-hmm. well, that might work, you know, in the summer of 68 when you're 18 or 22. But try doing free love when you're 27, 28, 29, 30, and you're married. It just yeah. doesn't work. Yeah. Well, it becomes swinging then. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a whole different vibe. <laughs> <laughs> so she switches over to Stevie and Lindsay stop and then yeah. she starts a banging the mick she starts sleeping with with mick fleetwood who was the is the drummer and right. he was he was sort of looked on because he wasn't involved in any like the interband mingling he was looked on as sort of like their father figure right so this was the relationship that really destabilized them because like what are you doing like mm-hmm. you're you're making the one neutral party we have not neutral <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> you're activating the totem pole and so you don't know like the end of the story. Who's she with now? Like who? I don't know. Don't know. I don't know. She's not with anybody. Okay. She's. Uh, I'm sure fans know, and they're screaming at us right now. But we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, the last thing that I read was that, that she wasn't with anybody. She's in her 70s now. Uh, they're still on tour, and she doesn't. The last thing that I read about it, the last article that I read, the most recent one, said that she wasn't uh, dating anybody because romance has gone out of the world. Like mm. She thinks that the internet and cell phone addiction has completely taken away our ability to connect honestly with people. I don't think she's wrong. I don't think so also, either. Also, when you're 70, I mean, you're like, I did it hard and I'm good. <laughs> yeah, I'm fine. I'm all right. <laughs> I'm good now. Well, I just wanted to bring all that up to say that, um, and this is still a long time ago in 97, when Fleetwood Mac regrouped for the dance tour, uh, Stevie and Lindsay Buckingham performed this song alone on stage, often getting teary-eyed towards the end. The emotional performances were repeated on subsequent tours as fans were always eager to see the ex-lovers share a poignant moment, which could range in intensity from like hand-holding to passionate soul-gazing. Uh, Stevie insists that those are real emotions on display. She told Rolling Stone, you can go on stage and have a bit of a love affair, and when you go back to your separate dressing rooms, it's over. But while you're on stage, it's real. And uh, that's probably about as much cheating as she can handle anymore. <laughs> I would think so. <laughs> like, it's just we're going to cheat in song mm-hmm. on stage now and then don't come to my dressing room yeah. door. <laughs> I'm going to look into your eyes for three minutes every second or third night in a new city every time. And that's as close as I want to get to you ever again. <laughs> <laughs> it makes sense. It's like we can... Um, uh, what's the word when you're just... Um, Thinking about old times, like nostalgia. Have, yeah, we can have mm. a nostalgic moment, and then, but that—that's it. 
That's good. <laughs> yeah. And then a landslide will bring us down. Yep. And then a landslide will bring you down. down. All right. Is that... I think that's good. I think that's a good enough and all you need to cover on Landslide, unless you have more. No. Okay. We could, you could spend six hours talking about how Fleetwood Mac interacted with each other and just pretend to be, not pretend to be, but be sort of shocked by it. Yeah. Like, it's amazing to think, like, this is some really, like, it's mild music, it's emotional music, it's honest music, but it's also really easy listening mm-hmm. elevator music. Like, you would think with yeah, it's all, all of, of that, that turmoil... All of those drugs, all of those betrayals, that these songs would be edgier. No, nah, no. It's, yeah, it's very, I've, I've thought of like every Fleetwood Mac song is like roll down the windows and do that little thing with your hand with the wind outside of the car. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like Rhiannon is like that. Um, even on her own, Gypsy is like that. Mm-hmm. It's all very flowing, white witchy. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Here's to the white witch. Well, we haven't completely finished talking about Stevie Nicks because our Dressed Up Like a Douche is a Stevie Nicks song. Oh? So do you remember when it was like one of our very early Dressed Up Like a Douche from uh, a guy I went to high school with, Jason Dana. He did Boise instead of Poison by Belle Biv DeVoe. Uh Boise. Boise. Well, anyway, this is his wife. Uh, it comes from Wendy Dana, and it's the song Edge of 17 by Stevie Nicks. And this one is very common. It's um, instead of uh, just like the white winged dove, instead of white winged dove, she thought it was one winged dove, <laughs> which is really funny when you just picture this one bird, like, you know, flying around in circles because it's only got one wing. I, thought it was, I always thought it was just like the world we know. That's funny. Yeah. I thought it was just like the one we love. <laughs> <laughs> no one can get this right. It seems so simple. One wing dove. And everybody has a different version. <laughs> I'm always amazed when we hear like a, a dressed up like a douche is like so crazy outlandish. It's like, what is fucking going on in your head? Right. Like every misheard lyric that I have kind of like makes some right. level of sense. You fit like, it in. Like the one we had last Last week, I'm still thinking, or with the Earl song that "Don't Call My Lawyer" <laughs> with the Dumb Love Girls, I keep thinking about that. Like, how? How did that person get there? <laughs> so weird. <laughs> All right, Ben, do you have a guilty pleasure song? Guilty pleasures. I do have a guilty pleasure song. This is a karaoke favorite Uh-oh. amongst uh, certain ladies. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is Black Velvet by Alana Miles. Black Velvet and my little boy smile. Is that what she says? Yep. Okay. <laughs> Black Velvet in that slow. soft southern sky. Slow southern sky. I soft, have no slow idea. Slow southern sky? I have no idea. I don't know. All I know is that I absolutely do sing that out of the top of my lungs. I do. I don't want anybody religion. knowing it. Does Rob Mungle know that you like this song? I'll have to tell him. Okay, our friend Kristen Linder, another comic. <laughs> we have, A lot of comedians do karaoke. We want to do it all. We want to be funny <laughs> and be singers. We do this a lot. And our friend Kristen Linder always sang this, and uh, it would make our other friend Rob Mungle just irate because he hates yeah. it. And so next time we all do it, if we ever get together and do it again, that's what we should do at the end of quarantine is all the comics get together and go do karaoke. Do karaoke. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Rob would just go ape shit. So next time we do it, you need to get up there and sing it. <laughs> <laughs> just make him so mad. <laughs> What's your guilty pleasure tune? Um, I completely forgot about this song until I heard it on the radio. And I was like, ha, ah, I don't know if it's guilty. Like as far as like, do other people think it's a jam? I feel like it's a song you should make fun of. And I'll explain why, but it's Never Surrender by Corey Hart. Do you remember this? <laughs> oh, yeah, of course. So people don't know, Corey Hart also did the Sunglasses at Night mm-hmm. song. So I don't know. There's something about a douchey, heartthrob Corey Hart. You know, the good-looking type singing a chorus that with his voice all gruffled and his eyes closed, making a fist. You can never surrender. Never surrender. But then, like, I don't know. I like the beat and the tempo of the rest of the song. Like, it's, I feel like I could dance to it even at numbers. It's almost like New Wave, but it's more like just heartthrob boy pop. Do you like Never Surrender more than you like Sunglasses at Night? I don't love Sunglasses at Night. No? No, it's fine. It's, I, I don't hate it, but uh, I, I would rather hear Never Surrender. I was shocked. I was, I was doing some kind of research, and Sunglasses at Night came up, and I was just shocked at how early it was like when do you think sunglasses at night was 
Well, it isn't I think Never Surrender is like eighty three or something? So is it around that same time? Uh, Sunglasses at Night is eighty three. I think okay. Never Surrender is a little later. Oh, is it okay? But I was kind of surprised. I was three years old in nineteen eighty three. Oh wow! That's and I always so... thought that Corey Hart was like was like contemporary. Like when I started listening to music at like seven or eight, I thought he was the big hit. I'm like no, I was five years old already. Lots of reruns. Did he have anything else besides Never Surrender and? Sunglasses that night. I'm sure he had some other hits in Canada, but I think he was. I think he was quickly forced back up north. Gotcha. Once the Americans discovered Brian Adams, they're just like one Canadian at a time. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> There's like who's the Springfield guy? I just always think of all of them as kind of the same, like Neil in Young. the same vein. <laughs> you think of Neil Young? No, the um, it's a like a heartthrob from the '80s that everybody like had their posters. Rick Springfield. Rick Springfield. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I just I don't know. I think about them all the same. Guilty pleasures. Um, okay, now the exciting thing is we get to tell you guys the song that's up for a vote uh, on Thursday. I've already put it out there to the Patreon listeners uh, on the website. But we are going with three songs from Pat Benatar. Ooh. This is going to be fun. So mm-hmm. the three songs they will be voting on is Hit Me With Your Best Shot, Love is a Battlefield, and We Belong. Yes. We belong to the night. We belong to... I, I, I don't know if I have a favorite that I'm leaning towards. I don't ever want to sway the vote, but... Um, I don't either, but I do want to talk about Pat Benatar. Yeah. Doesn't matter. Vote yeah. for whatever you like. Yeah. I'm excited. All right. A little more business. Again, special thank you to Chuck Savage and Eddie Hawkins for our amazing intro music and to Chuck by himself for the personalized music bumpers that he does for each episode, which is so nice of him. Um, Also, thank you to Sarah Westling for the Guilty Pleasures vocals, which my son still likes to bust out in (laughs) public. Uh, If you would like to support the podcast, you can join our Patreon for $5 a month at uh, patreon.com slash rock the cash bar. With that five bucks, you'll get some cool swag and the chance to vote on all Thursday songs. We have a Spotify playlist of all the songs we cover, including the Guilty Pleasure songs. It's searchable on Spotify. It's just like rock the cash bar podcast playlist. Um, Or you can find the direct link on our website, rockthecashbarpodcast.com. Thank you for tuning in. New episodes every Monday and Thursday. If you have a misheard song lyric you'd like us to read on the podcast, which no one ever does this, do it. Send us one. Send us, I mean, you don't have to email us. Just tell us on any social media. When you think of one, send it to us, please. Um, and Find us on all the things. And thank you guys so much. And we will see you again on Thursday. Text me. You got my number. As it is above, so it is below. Open up your gates in all directions. As we're doing a salute to the witchy women. And all salute the dark goddess Lilith. Sorry, I had to make sure that I pay proper respects to the witch Stevie Nicks. Oh, I think we have to. I'm so sorry I forgot to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Vogue. Vogue.